the right, when we draw these regular lines, what we have to appreciate is the lines that are horizontal are considered to be atoms coming out towards us, the way these wedges are. Vertical lines in a Fisher projection represent atoms receding away from us, and the carbon, as it says here, is at that intersection. Fisher projections are especially useful if we have a molecule with several chiral centers because you can put them next to each other and determine quickly if they are identical, if they are enantiomers, or neither of those. Uh, it's not easy glancing at a Fisher projection to tell the R isomer from the S. Uh, ball and stick models and wedges and dashes are much more uh, amenable for doing that kind of thing. But sometimes we're not trying to simply determine do we have a pair of enantiomers, are they R and S. Uh, other times we compare chiral molecules for different reasons. Fisher projections are old-fashioned, but they are also uh, still useful because they certainly allow us to draw structures in a quick fashion. And if we know what they represent, they can still tell us something useful. You tend to see Fisher projections when you're studying molecules with several chiral centers, and sugars or carbohydrates fall into that category. And so here are two sugars. They both are C6H12O6. And in fact, there are about a dozen such sugars that are all different in terms of their chirality. And if you look at each of these, they have a chain of six carbons, four of which, the ones in the middle, are chiral in each of these. Now, Glucose on the left is not an enantiomer of galactose. They are stereoisomers, but they're not mirror images of each other. You can pick out parts of the molecule where they appear to be mirror images, but other parts where they are not. And that leads us to this last topic of diastereomers. But the point of this slide is to show that the distinction between what makes glucose and galactose different it's easy to see those differences if we use Fisher projections. You can see that they're identical at the top carbon, carbon 2 here, uh, same thing, but there is a oppositeness to the configuration at carbon, uh, well, carbon 3 is the same. The oppositeness is at carbon 4. Notice it's at carbon 4 where they appear to be mirror images. But carbon 5 looks like things are perfectly superimposable with its uh, isomer on the right, and, and carbon-6 is identical for both. So as it says here, it's only at carbon-4 where we have that difference in stereochemistry, and so a Fisher projection allows us to do this and to see this. And if you're looking at a number of sugars, they will all be similar unless you have some way to appreciate their difference in stereochemistry. And you can certainly appreciate that drawing a bunch of wedges and dashes is not nearly as quick and convenient as drawing these projections. But even though these are looking like a bunch of flat bonds in the plane of the screen here, they are very much part of uh, three-dimensional tetrahedral carbons. Now, like I said, those last two models are diastereomers of each other. Uh, they're stereoisomers that are not enantiomers. Um, they will have more than one chiral carbon. That's a requirement for us to have diastereomers. And, uh, and as it says, they, they won't be mirror images where they match up in the way that enantiomers do. And as it says here, diastereomers will have a number of different physical properties, different melting points if they are solids, boiling points if they're liquids. And so they are much easier to separate from one another than the way enantiomers do, or the enantiomers are. And this last slide shows an example of a set of diastereomers.